Buonasera a tutti. Good evening and welcome to the British School of Rome. Um, we are here tonight for a uh, lecture as part of the architecture program. The previous um, events included uh, a lecture by Jean-Louis Cain as part in connection to the current exhibition at the Maxi on architecture and war and previously uh, a dialogue between Richard Deacon, the sculptor, and Eric Parry, architect. And the forthcoming event will be a, another dialogue between Fedor Pirvi and Thomas Schutte. But tonight uh, we are delighted again to uh, have a collaboration of um, the Netherlands um, we, have, we are delighted to have here tonight uh, Wouter von, von Stippout, um, who is the co-curator of the Architecture Biennale British Pavilion of last year, 2014. And the pavilion was the uh, same uh, title as the uh, lecture tonight, Clockwork Jerusalem, Architecture, Politics, Riots and the Belief in a Better World. Um, the, lecture will be introduced by a salute by the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Mr. Michiel van Hont, followed by an, uh, a presentation by the senior curator of architecture of the Maxi, Ippo Chorra. So without any further ado, please welcome Mr. Michiel van Hont. Good evening. Thank you, Jacopo Benci, for your kind words and for giving me the opportunity to say a few words on the occasion of the lecture by Wouter van Stiphout. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Wouter van Stiphout once said, I do believe that architecture and design, as a combination of pure speculation, rhetorical poetics, and technical capacity, could play a role in politics. I hope you still stand behind the statement. <laughs> Today we talk about a Clockwork Jerusalem. The British presentation is last, at last year's Biennale di Venezia, which was curated by Wout van Stiphout Studio, Crimson Architectural Historians, and FAT Architects. The studio is aimed to offer insight into the way architecture has been central to shaping a new vision of society. The exhibition has explored how the modern future of Britain was built from a combination of interests. Also, the exhibition has shown how this has changed our physical and, and imaginative landscapes. Mr. van Stiphout's statement also highlights the crucial role of the creative industries, and in particular architecture and design. The Dutch government acknowledges this potential and has put the strengthening of creative industries at the very heart of its policies of development and culture. Today's lecture fits in the steady collaboration that has developed between the British School at Rome and my embassy. Almost every year, a Dutch architect is invited to join the architecture series curated by Marina Engel. Is that an explosion or fireworks? <laughs> fireworks. Fireworks for the as I said, almost every year a Dutch architect is invited to join the architecture series curated by Marina Engel. I would like to thank Marina for her important contribution and for her capability to develop these exciting conferences with leading international architects. The international orientation of these series underlines the global character of today's architectural practice and illustrates the close relationship between the Netherlands and Great Britain in this field. As you all know, Wout van Stiphout is a founding partner of Studio Crimson Architectural Historians in Rotterdam and a professor of design and politics at Delft University of Technology. Well, I served in the Middle East for a while and <laughs> I believe this is still fireworks. <laughs> but when I say down... <laughs> 
No, let me be serious. As you all know, Wouter van Stiphout is a founding partner of studying Crimson Architectural Historians in Rotterdam, and he is a professor of design and politics at Delft University of Technology. My embassy has had the privilege to work with Wouter van Stiphout and his studio on various occasions. We supported their exhibition, The Banality of Good, New Towns, Architecture, Architects, Money and Politics, at the 2012 Venice Biennale. And last year, Simon, Simone Rotz was invited as a speaker at the conference, Communicating Architecture at the Maxi Museum, of which we were a partner. And Michel Provost has participated at our Greenhouse Talk during the previous days of the Biennale in Venezia. In, uh, Venezia. Ladies and gentlemen, architecture is about shaping our cities and providing solutions for the great challenges we have to face in the coming years. We must affirm the crucial role that design can have. As the promotion of Dutch creative industry is at the heart of our activities in Italy, we have launched a program related to the themes of the Expo, which starts in Milano on May the 1st. And these themes are water, food, and energy. We have selected five projects, of which four are related to architecture. This, not will be, this will not be a demonstration of what wonderful buildings Dutch arch architects are able to design. No, we aim at a dialogue between Dutch and Italian professionals to solve actual problems. Therefore, we will support the process of providing new applications for monumental farms in Milano, and we will work, we will work together with the city of Taranto in providing more sustainable spatial solutions based on a series of workshops with Italian and Dutch professionals, as well as local organizations. And I'm happy to welcome the team of Project Mercato al Centro, which is, has invited three professionals from Holland to generate solutions for the re revitalization of the local market in the Terzo Municipio. There will be a public discussion tomorrow at half past four at the Casa della Città in Via della Moletta, number 85. So don't miss it. We believe that the input of architects and designers with a combination of pure speculation, rhetorical poetics and technical capacity will play a crucial role in providing practical and inclusive solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, I would like to thank the British School at Rome once more I will now pass the microphone to Pippo Ciorra, senior curator at the Maxi Museum, and somebody who, in the two and a half years that I've been in Rome, uh, I've come across a good number of times. Uh, and he will introduce the work of Wouter van Stiphout. We are looking forward to collaborate on, ex on, on, ex on an exciting project with Mr. Ciorra later this year at the Maxi. This is an ongoing cooperation, and we're very happy with it. Uh, and let me say a special thank you to Wouters van Stiphout himself for accepting the invitation to be here and to all of you for joining us today. Enjoy the lecture. Thank you. This is going to be English. Is it okay? Uh, I'm jealous because I never had fireworks for a lecture, so... But, uh, last year, um, actually a little more than a year ago, I found myself writing on an article on, on an Italian newspaper, a manifesto, that the most interesting architecture event of 2013 was Getzi Park. So, uh, I was interested in the fact that and I'm not so interested when architects want to be political, because when an architect says, I want to be political, then generally disasters come. But I'm very interested when politics become architecture, because when politics become architecture, we understand that architecture is made of many things. It's made of many forces, ideas, events, things. So I think what's very interesting in the work, interesting in the work of uh, Crimson's, which I will not introduce, thanks to the generosity of the ambassador, uh, is the fact that they open up the box of architecture to 
make clear the relationship between many different things that do, that make architecture part of our life. So politics, life of the people, movement, the urban condition, the city. This is really, I think this is really important. I think this also answers to Marina's ambition to clearly insert the work of uh, Crimson in this very beautiful series which deals with collaboration between architecture and the other forms of creativity, I said it. Uh, so, uh, we are really interested in this collaboration. Marina is interested in say how the act of designing happens across architecture and other issues. Uh, Crimson's hate the word creativity, but between this tension, I think we clearly understand uh, what, what this means, the work they do, they are, it's interesting. Crimson are very interesting to, it, it's a collective of historians, uh, which is already a new approach. Now we are waiting for a new uh, historical paradigm since when Kenneth Frampton wrote this book, and we're still waiting, so we thank them for this approach, a collective approach to history. This is already very much, very interesting, very new, very revealing, I think. Uh, second, this idea of putting together, I mean, they're not studying the city, they're not studying the architecture. They're studying the architecture and the city together, and they are opening up this relation to, to see how it is made of, what it is made of, what are the elements, and that's where the dialogue, the collaboration, the discussion between the architecture knowledge and all the other uh, ideas that are around happens. This can sound very abstract, but thank God, the Crimsons gave us two very clear explanations of this way of working in the last two Biennale. You know? In 2012, it was the, uh, what was the name, the good? Banality. The banality of good. It was this beautiful installation on new towns, which was for me basically the only interesting part of the Chipperfield Biennale. Uh, and it was wonderfully staging the idea of how you can look at the idea of Newtown from two different points of views, the architectural knowledge and discipline and the real life and the market and see how these two things together create in the end reality. In this last Biennale we had the, the clockwork Jerusalem, which is what Walter is going to speak about tonight. And so again, a new way of staging a section of modernism, but not between, not only in the scene of modernism, but in the scene of architecture, but in the scene of so many other elements of the life of people, which in the end make the architecture significant, make the meaning of architecture actually really happen. So I think I'm very thankful for the work we do. I'm very happy we're trying to work together and we will work together for the next exhibition exactly on the themes that the ambassador was quoting before, I don't want to be longer because I think, but it's, it's, it's a great way of working together. I think it's a way, great way of approaching uh, history. Uh, I love the fact if you go through their website, the list of words make no difference between lecture buildings because they do participate to design process, which is another kind of self-referred interdisciplinary process between history, design, uh, and urbanism. And, and they list all their works in the same way, a lecture, a book, a building, an event, an exhibition. I think this is really interesting. This is really a very good answer to Marina's quest for interdisciplinary efforts. So I really thank you, and I, I, I mean, apologize for all the confusion that you made, and I invite you here at the stage. Grazie. So thank you all for uh, coming, and thank you for having me, uh, uh, both uh, Brit uh, British School and Dutch Embassy and Maxi. You're making me feel extremely uh, welcome uh, here in, in Rome. Um, people made a remark, um, very indiscreet remark, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that I told him uh, in confidence that I actually hated the word creativity. <clears throat> Well, this has, this has something to do, I, I think, with the way that our office uh, uh, developed. In the beginning, it was not so. In the beginning, we actually hated the word uh, research, or we hated the word be, uh, historical, 
because in the beginning we were we said we are historians but we can be we also can be an office we also can have impact we also can can make things just just as much as architects so whenever we 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 try to make that claim an architect would say ah oh, that's great so you're historian so you can do some research for us then we we then we hated that we said no we are we are just as able as you are uh, to change things to make things then when we had finally kind of uh, developed uh, uh, our skills or developed our reputation that we have those skills uh, that we could actually also take part in design processes etc uh, then we came up to to the next level which was that we would present our ideas just as uh, architects uh, uh, just as architects do and then we would meet the kind of the glazed over stare of for example civil servants in in the municipal offices or or uh, builders or etc and then they would say ha huh, yeah that's a very creative <laughs> and then we would know that's it it's dead this project is dead we're gone we we are uh, creative is as a, as a kind of a, an other word for uh, um, irrelevant and uh, gone and out of the door uh, the same were the same goes for the word inspiring <laughs> when when uh, when somebody with whom you wish to create something says huh very inspiring that always means that that person has other fish to fry you know he has the bottom line and uh, so very inspiring maybe some other time so for us the um, but a little bit more seriously the word creativity has also you have this term called creative industries in which also architecture is now been become part of the creative industries uh, and in a, something behind that is, is sort of problematic because it means that once architecture is in the policies is being presented as a creative industry that means that it is separated as a thing as a commodity and you can sell it to someone or give it to some uh, someone while our maybe extremely romantic idea of working in architecture working in planning is not that architecture is a goal in itself is like an art piece in itself or a quality in itself but know that that architecture is has the same urgency and has the same kind of validity as let's say finance or let's say uh, healthcare or let's that 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 architecture is a real player in the way that society is creating itself and recreating itself constantly not a piece of luxury stuff uh, on the edge so this is my um, but still, of course, I recognize that the only thing that we are interested in is creating things, which is also why all these people that we put together here, we have mixed up uh, so sociologists, uh, politicians, we have mixed up politicians who demolished a welfare state, we have politicians there who created one, uh, Willem Drees, the, the Dutch kind of, the, the creator of the Dutch post-war welfare state, Margaret Thatcher, we have Jane Jacobs and her nemesis, uh, Robert Moses, we have uh, Ebenezer Howard and Le Corbusier, so all, all these people, it's a mixture of poli politicians, sociologists, planners, civil servants, uh, uh, stenographers, because that was the job of uh, Ebenezer Howard. And the, the, the interesting thing with all these people did was that they were actually, we, we call them, let's call them all architects, or let's call them all, if you will, creative. Um, th this, the badges uh, that you see here are actually, they were used to launch uh, the chair of designers politics when it started in Delft a few years back. And the chair of designers politics is actually it's an interesting f uh, thing because it was, uh, com it was uh, endowed, it's a publicly endowed chair by the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment in the Netherlands. And they wanted, uh, they wanted uh, to inject into the, they wanted to create a chair for design and politics, not as, and politics. Because the, the minister, she said, uh, I have the feeling that 
we politicians, we policymakers, do not know enough of design. And then she went to the University of Delft and she said, uh, uh, do you want to work on this together? And then the University of Delft said, that's interesting because we think that designers do not know enough about politics. So uh, the chair of design and politics was born. As soon as I started on this chair, though, I, it, to me it was very important to rename it, to not see design and politics as two separate worlds that might need ambassadors, if you will, in each other's domain. But to the polemical point of, of replacing the word and with the word as was to say that design is already political. Whether the architect says, I am political, or I want to be a politician, or he or, or doesn't, doesn't matter. Design is by definition political. To put it in a very banal way, it's political because you're spending other people's money. And it's political because you're intruding into public space. It's political. You can say it's not. You can say that your work is not about polit po politics, but it is about the sky and the earth and the sun and the moon. It's always political, whatever you do. We also thereby say that politics is always a form of design, uh, what, I, what I've just explained to you. So the whole point of this chair was actually a kind of Faustian uh, forced wedding uh, between politics and, uh, and architecture. Uh, but that's just an, uh, a, a small introduction to uh, the word creativity. Now, um, I... I wanted to start out this presentation with a, a record sleeve from 1978 uh, by a band from Birmingham called Steel Pulse. And this, this was a, a roots reggae band. Uh, the, the, the people in Steel Pulse are still touring. Uh, it's a band of, uh, of, uh, of um, Rastafarian uh, musicians. And this is their first album. And what you see in this album is something very strange. You see a landscape that is clearly uh, tropical, uh, could be Jamaica, could be Africa. And, but you see that landscape sort of intruding in, 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 a land, in, in another landscape, an urban landscape of broken down uh, council estates, of burnt out cars, etc. And then you see children in, in, in traditional dress standing there. Um, the, the album is called Handsworth Revolution. Handsworth is, is, a, is, a, is an area uh, in Birmingham where the band came from. What this album cover actually tells is a, is a very strange allegorical uh, story that, that talks about how in the late 70s, English neighborhoods, English popular neighborhoods like Handsworth were, were in a terrible state. Uh, they were very poor. Uh, but also how these neighborhoods might be headed towards some form of destruction, some form of, of, of ap some apocalyptic uh, event, um, turning them into, uh, into uh, a ruin. But at the same time that out of the ruin grows this tropical nature, a tropical nature that is actually, uh, and there is not such a mountain in, in Birmingham, I assure you. Um, there is also not this kind of informal housing yet in, the, in, the, in the Birmingham. So what, what, this tell, what this tells you is as if out of a little bit like what they said about May 1968, sous le, plavé, sous le pavé la plage, so underneath the cobble, underneath the stones, the beach, you, you break open this big mineral uh, modernist city and out of it uh, comes, na you, you are restored to a... a uh, uh, to nature. Uh, the same thing happens a little bit here. And interestingly enough, uh, when I interviewed uh, David Hines, who is the, the songwriter and the main singer of uh, Steel Pulse, uh, about this, he said that actually this was a, a manifesto. This al it was an allegory as a manifesto. It was a manifesto for how uh, Babylon will fall. Babylon in Rastafarian uh, uh, speech is, uh, is another word for uh, the Western, uh, secular Western uh, society. 
and Zion will come through. Zion is a kind of the idealistic name uh, for the nation of, of uh, for, for the, the, the you, you could say the, the nation, the culture of Rastafarianism, but it also refers to Africa, the, or, the, the country of origin of the Jamaican Rastafarians, and it can also refer uh, to, the, to the local culture of, of a group of Rastafarian, uh, of the Rastafarian community. So what you see here is one form of community sprouting from the ruins of another, of, of, of Babylon. So the Western, uh, the, the Western uh, colonial, um, oppressive, racist environment is crumbling down and out of it sprouts uh, the community of the oppressed who are now being set free and take control over their own neighborhood by gradually growing into it. That, that was the explanation uh, by the, the, the man who was uh, the, responsible for the making of, of this album cover. And it is an interesting form, it is an interesting uh, combination of politics and religion used in an architectural uh, allegory. And uh, I will come back to it, uh, and, and, and it's played an important role in our uh, exhibition in, in, uh, in Venice. Uh, here you have uh, another album of, uh, of Steel Pulse called True Democracy. Here you have David Hines speaking from the book uh, to his uh, band, bandmates. And, the, and here, this is a picture of Hansworth one year after the, uh, the album cover. So the album cover even had a sort of a prophetic, uh, as you can see, prof be a pro he also looks like a prophet, and the prophecy uh, came out. So, what these, what these, uh, so th this album cover for us works on so many levels. It works on the level of being an allegory of the myths, and you could say the metaphysics uh, of, of urban imagination. It, it, it talks about politics, it talks about the, the, the multi-ethnic, multicultural society, but it also talks about how sometimes this popular culture, if, which is always very much separated uh, from, uh, uh, from analysis about cities, uh, from architectural analysis, how this popular culture uh, pro can produce images, can produce ideas that actually have worked nearly as a, as a seismograph uh, to tensions that are actually alive uh, in cities, because David Hines knew very well uh, that some, something was about to burst, something was about to crack uh, in these communities uh, that, his, his, uh, that he came from. Now, um, we go uh, 130 years uh, backwards in time, uh, this is another imagination. This is a book uh, by William Morris, the, the, the famous uh, designer, activist, politician, writer. Uh, uh, William Morris, and here you can see these things working together in a different way, but, but the same things in a, in a similar but slightly different order. Will, uh, William Morris, a uh, very f um, important book, utopian book, was called News from Nowhere, and it describes an ideal English... Uh, an ideal England of the future, an England that has given up, that has, that has given up on all uh, industry, that has even given up on policing, on, on institutionalized education. It has given up on cities, on large cities, on, on, on mecha mechanized transport. It is an England that has gone back. He was also a member of the Pre-Raphaelite Society. It is an England that, that has gone back to a pure state of people doing just what they want, what the, the, of the craftsmanship, living together with small groups of people in wonderful houses in the English countryside, and harmony and love uh, uh, is restored to, the, uh, to England after, in a period, of course, of the, ver the, the harshest period you can imagine of, uh, of Victorian uh, industrialization. And the interesting thing is that the... the, the, the um, uh, inspiration uh, for this book, and also the uh, came from a riot, a huge riot uh, involved in, became involved in. It was a, it, it was a riot. Uh, uh, it was a, a class riot on Trafalgar Square, on Trafalgar Square, and uh, witnessing this, even being part of it, made such an impression on William Morris that he decided to write his book. 
Now the book starts the book starts with this same riot, only he then describes a different outcome. He describes how the riot destroyed uh, the, the fabric of, of the English uh, industrialist society and that the riot then caused that all to collapse and that in 1953, because the riot happened in 1851, that in 1953, so it's a future, it was a, a futuristic uh, science fiction book, News from Nowhere, uh, uh, England would be restored uh, to this uh, wonderful green land uh, that it uh, should have once been and should once be again. So again we can see here this combination of the fa of, of this f a combination of fantasizing or prophesizing uh, the collapse of modern modern society and out of that coming this wonderful green world again of purity and, and harmony just like steel pulse uh, more than a century later. Everything to escape this. Now, if we go back even further, we're coming closer now to uh, clockwork, the, uh, the Jerusalem part of clockwork. Also, the great poet and radical mystic uh, William Blake, as a young printer, actually, a young graphic designer, you would, but that, that, if that would not be an anachronism, got caught up in a riot in the late 18th century in London, uh, the Gordon Riots. And, getting, and this is the Gordon Riots also, uh, also burnt down Newgate uh, Prison, and this is one of the things that he, this young uh, poet and uh, designer, artist, uh, witnessed. And also here, he, what he he nearly turned this into a mystical experience uh, to, to witness uh, this explosion of popular uh, rage. He uh, imagined that this was a protest against the very, very first uh, signs of an industrializing, modernizing city that was pulling people apart in classes, uh, that was uh, creating exploiters and the exploited, that was taking away uh, uh, that, was take, that was ripping apart uh, the kind of old family ties and the ties to the, uh, to the tradition, etc., from before. And, and, and partly inspired uh, by, by this, uh, William Blake, here you have him. Um, William Blake um, wrote uh, the, his famous uh, uh, poem that, was late, that later would become the hymn, uh, Jerusalem in which he said, I will, in the, the last stanza reads, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Now, what this means is the idea that religion, as something to strive for the better world, is no longer something purely, you could say, spiritual, but needs to be a course of action, a course for, for action. Uh, to build Jerusalem is not to strive for the city of God, like uh, Augustine, and not to go and, and conquer some Middle Eastern place, also called Jerusalem, but to strive to build the city of God, the better city, uh, in here and now, in, in the place where you are now. And to do that uh, because also the, this, this poem uh, describes the, the dark satanic mills, these first factories, where the textile mills uh, were, where people were being dehumanized. And this shocked him so much to his core that he said, we, have to, we cannot accept that. We cannot accept this course of, of society. We have to build Jerusalem uh, in the here and now. And this, of course, we, in our, uh, Sam Jacob and, and myself, uh, when we were curators of this exhibition in Venice, we said that now that is the real birthplace of modernism. That is the real source of modernism. Uh, modernism first as a form of shock, a form of disgust with the way that society is, uh, is, is developing and the, the energy to try and put something in its place. So for us modernism is is also a form of resistance, is a form of not accepting how things are going, but to build something else. 
and the idea that a bit, so to escape the fatalism and to, to really believe that you can build a new world, that a new world is not just a matter of evolution, but that a new world is actually something that can be created, something that can be designed, not just spatially, but actually how people live together socially. You can design an economy, you can design a, 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 a society. And of course, uh, William Blake was only the first in a very, very long uh, series of British mystics. Uh, for example, this is the um, uh, this is the the uh, the, uh, the Salvation Army. The, the person who uh, no, I forgot his name. Oh, mm -hmm. terrible! But then I was never a good Salvation <laughs> Army uh, no. uh, <laughs> a soldier. But this is this is the the, the person who who invented the Salvation Army. Also based on this entire cosmology of how the world should be uh, or reordered again. And of course, this was also, uh, it, this led in the 19th century to, it could go from, uh, uh, from a Christian, uh, uh, Christian cults traveling to America and starting over there, but also to uh, Kropotkinesque Krop Kropotko uh, communities uh, start, uh, starting all over again in the English countryside. This whole idea of starting all over again, uh, releasing yourself from where society is going and building a new one, that is something that we find to be the real kind of core of, uh, of modernism. Of course, it was all, all, always nearly uh, based on, on, on the sheer scale of the inequality and the poverty uh, that was happening uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to cities like uh, London. Here you can see the famous uh, poverty maps that were being made of London and with the, from the absolute dejected uh, criminal uh, poor up to, the, uh, up to the middle classes. And of course the most famous product for, uh, ar for the architecture world, uh, talk of a crossover, uh, was by the stenographer and radical farmer uh, uh, Ebenezer Howard, who had tried his luck also at uh, farming in the United States, who had tried his luck as, as a writer, uh, all of those things he was not very good at, but then he made this one drawing, just one diagram. He was not an architect, he was none of those things. He made one drawing of a circle, this is a part of it, in which he said, we can realize this new society uh, where there is no longer uh, this enmity between uh, this polarization between the countryside and the city, between the factory, the, the factory owner and the, and the laborer, uh, between uh, uh, children and, and adults, we, we can actually make a city that is built up of the smallest element of human uh, uh, co uh, community, the family, and we can make it nearly as a cosmos, as a cosmology of how people can live together, the garden city model. And interestingly enough, this model is both incredibly mystic and incredibly metaphysical and incredibly theoretical. And at the same time, it is incredibly thought through. It is thought through to the level of if uh, buying cheap land in, 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 on the English countryside, in England, England's green and pleasant land, as William Blake would have it, uh, to buy it cheaply and then to gradually uh, have it being colonized by the people who take part in this garden city movement, thereby ra raising the prices, thereby being able to ask for rent, etc. It was like a perpetual mobile of, of land values and, uh, and a small economy of, uh, of, of people working there together. And the interesting thing was that this model that then became throughout the whole 20th century the most used model for state and public planning, when it was thought up by Ebenezer Howard, he believed that it could only be done without any interference from government, that it was a way to escape from the system as it was, not, uh, to, um, n not as a tool for the system. But of course, especially in the post-war period, the Garden City model was exported over the entire world, more or less, and became the strong a diagram that you still recognize in how people are planning cities right now. Another theme that is actually present also already 
in uh, for what for me is this key image of a steel pulse is the ruin, the idea of the ruin. Now this is an image from also from the uh, 18th century. It is a, it's, it's actually an architectural rendering. It's a, 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 a visualization, an artist's impression, if you will. Uh, Sir John Soane, who was then uh, the architect of the Bank of England, which was then being built, asked his, his uh, trusty, trusted uh, uh, artist, uh, uh, Joseph Gandhi, uh, to make renderings, to make uh, artist impressions of uh, the Bank of England uh, f because it was not finished yet then. And he asked him specifically uh, to paint it as a ruin. Of, co of course this has, uh, the, and, the, and there are several of these uh, paintings commissioned by the architect uh, to Joseph Gandhi to paint his own, uh, st as yet uh, his designs as ruins. And there are two ways, of, uh, what you can see there in the, um, I'm not sure if this one has a, yes, here you see some people digging. These are archaeologists. And of course, uh, I mean, th this place has a, has a very important role in that, in that tradition of Englishmen going abroad, digging about uh, in, in ruins of, of long, long, long uh, extinct uh, uh, cultures. Uh, and here, so what, what Sir John Soane and Joseph Gandhi do here is actually declaring the work of John Soane on a par with uh, the antiquities that they themselves had also been digging about in, 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 uh, in southern Europe. But not just that. It's not just saying we're as good as uh, Diocletian or, or anything like that. It's not just that. It's also, and that is so interesting, it's also imagining the end. It's also imagining a future apocalypse that might strike the, uh, the booming London of the 18th century so that maybe one day, maybe 200 years from now or from then, maybe 50 years from then, maybe 2,000 years from then, also, the London, the, work, the great works of London, will be dug about in by archaeologists from faraway countries. And it is this, I, and here what you can really see is that this imagination of the ruin is not just, an, is not just the romanticism of decay, it is also the birthplace of, fut of science fiction, in a way. It is the birthplace of, of imagining a future to look back on the present. Interestingly enough, uh, the, we juxtaposed, oops, we juxtaposed the last image with this image. This is an, because one of the things that uh, Gandhi also was able to do by painting it as a ruin, that's a more technical matter. If you paint something like a ruin, you can also show how the building is put together. You can show the tectonics of the building. You can show sections. You can show it op uh, kind of opened up uh, a building. Uh, we juxtapose it with this building. It was a competition entry by Peter and Alison Smithson uh, for the Golden Lane uh, uh, competition. And you can see here that they, they put the building they montaged it in an aerial picture of a bomb site in an English city. I think this was Coventry. They, they montaged it in, and then the building kind of grows out of it. But the building also looks ruinous. But it looks ruinous because it is a building made of a kit of parts. So it is getting put together in an industrial prefabricated way. And so what you can see here is the same interest in the ruin, and here maybe the ruin as a life-giving thing. The ruin, it's like the, the building comes as a phoenix from the ashes uh, uh, of bombed uh, London. And this was, of course, you have to, I hope that you are not in a too rational mode uh, tonight, because just see this as um, uh, Paolo Baratta, when he saw our exhibition in, uh, in, in Venice, he said, oh, that's a nice exhibition. It's like, a psych it's like you put uh, English architecture on the couch, in, and, uh, and this is kind of a psychoanalytical session in which, in, in a random order, dreams and obsessions and fears and traumatic experiences and, and deep secret desires 
just stream out. So that's what you are, that's what I am subjecting you uh, to here. Uh, here, what you see is the, the same period, this is an image from already during the war, where, where, where uh, the propaganda images by the English government were made, where new homes are being rise from, from London's ruins, as you can see. So this is this interesting, interesting sort of connection again between the new hope, uh, the new community rising from the ruins. Of course, the big difference here with the Steel Pulse uh, album cover and also maybe the William Blake uh, imagination and the William Morris imagination is that what rises from the ruins here is not a society that has shed all institutional uh, constraints and that has shed government and that has shed all modernity. No, here it is a, a heightened form of modernity, a heightened form of government uh, it is the welfare state, actually, that is rising here uh, from, the, uh, from the ruins of, of the, of the pre-war society. And the welfare state is, of course, this, this, this interesting combination of top-down power and then this nearly mystical idea of, of, a, of a paradise in which everyone is made happy and everyone is, is, is uh, given the same chances. Now, there is many, much, much material, in, uh, and I'm sure that some of this can also be found in the current exhibition in Maxi, uh, where, where, where modern architecture, uh, where the dream of modern architecture on your right side is, 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 made, uh, uh, is made possible by the destruction of the, of the old city. And this booklet in particular, uh, because I'm not showing the other, uh, uh, the other uh, page, this booklet says that Planes are good for cities in two ways. First, planes make it possible to make aerial photography of cities so that you can see what a mess it is and that you can see what you should actually be doing. Secondly, plane can drop planes can drop bombs on cities so you can actually clean up the mess and then make a, a beautiful new city. I'm from Rotterdam, so I can kind of see what, what they're see their point. Um, but in this same imagination, again, you can always see the, the, the modern, the, the, the light, the, the, the light of modernism arising from the darkness uh, of pre-war uh, society. But it, 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 there also is, a, is an interest, is always, especially specifically, I must say, may, or extra strongly in England, there's always this kind of schizophrenia between, it's not just uh, highly sophisticated modernist architecture, like the Lubetkin uh, uh, here, which is actually a pre-war building, uh, coming from uh, the, the darkness, but the, in the same series of posters, you would also have this. So your, Brit, so your Britain fight for it now is not just fight for it now, modernist, the welfare state, uh, large, uh, nearly industrial uh, uh, healthcare institutions that would spread healthcare equally over the entire population, but it is also fight for it now, our countryside, uh, our green and pleasant lands. So it is, at the sa it is Le Corbusier and William Morris at the same time, and sometimes mixed and sometimes uh, not. <laughs> And another large jump from uh, 1943, I suppose, to 1973, is that uh, one of, the, one of the, the most successful English new town, and I think it's also a fantastic place, I love going there, and I've been there, before you start laughing, or, um, is Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes was the most successful of the British new towns and it came at the very end. It was also the last one. When it was opened, Milton Keynes, this amazing monument to, uh, to what public sector planning could do, Margaret Thatcher opened, the newly elected Margaret Thatcher opened the shopping centre and she said, look at Milton Keynes, isn't it wonderful what the private sector can do? Which was actually also thereby, that was the very last, that was the very last, that was it. 
Then also public sector involvement in England, in planning, etc. That was it. She closed the door by, by giving this form of poisonous... It was a kind of a, 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 hand, a, kind of a, a, a poisonous kiss uh, to, to Milton Keynes. But what you can see here in Milton Keynes is the point of, of Derek Walker was to plan an entire city of tens of thousands of, of, of people in such a way that, that the landscape that the city covered would, after the city had been finished, would be greener than before. To plan the city in such a way that the trees would grow over the, the houses and you would not even see that the city was there. And it is this fantastic kind of, you could say, contradictory or even delusional uh, approach to urbanism that you can have your cake and eat it too, that you want Le Corbusier and William Morris at the same time. And both of, the, both of these things are deeply steeped in all kinds of mystical ideas of the British identity and the British landscape and modernity, etc. That was actually what our uh, exhibition was trying to convey. Here you have uh, Milton Keynes again, but then Milton Keynes from another angle, as a, as, a, as a kind of a consumer paradise. But again, a consumer paradise made possible by the powers of public planning. And then we discovered something strange. We discovered that the same, uh, the same guy who uh, designed the, uh, uh, the Milton Keynes ad advertising poster, which had always, to me, and as a child already, because we had a book at home called Utopias, and this was the biggest uh, image in it, and as a child I could look at this image endlessly, it turned out that he himself also had designed, in exactly the same period, uh, the poster for A Clockwork Orange. And A Clockwork Orange is, of course, so, uh, the, the film that is most famous for for kind of giving this, this extremely macabre and dark and dystopian view of what modern, a modernist society could be. And, it's, and this also exists in the same imagination. This exists in the same kind of cosmology where uh, the consumerist society is it, one page and uh, ultra-violence of beat, Beethoven-loving milk drinkers uh, like the the the, uh, the killers in, uh, in in Clockwork uh, in a Clockwork Orange, and therefore the title. We joined up a Clockwork with Jerusalem. Here you have them: modernity uh, according to a Clockwork Orange. I can I could watch this uh, this loop forever. <laughs> we could do that, no? Just I could just shut up, and we could just sit here. And... But there's more to follow. Um, so. This is a little bit how we put these things together. This is the, the first design of the book with the clockwork around the eye uh, of, of, of one of the droogs. Uh, and then we put in the eye of William Blake. And then the, uh, but one of the interesting things of this uh, film of uh, A Clockwork Orange is the fact that Stanley Kubrick chose a certain... He, he was sending out his scouts, when he was finding locations for this book by Anthony Burgess that says nothing really about, loca about uh, surroundings, to su where, which surrounding in England would fit the best with the, with, the, uh, with the drama unfolding. And then these are some of the pictures that his scouts came back with. This entirely new town being built uh, downstream uh, from central London, Thames Mead built by, the, uh, by the, the, the municipal architects of London, and it's a very, very interesting kind of architecture, late 60s, early 70s, where they use all this force and all this mass of prefabricated Corbusian concrete uh, elements, but then they, they, in a nearly neurotic way, are, are, are constantly configuring them and, and constantly creating a kind of a picturesque effect that would then be conditional for a new society uh, growing up there. And as you see, this is one of the very first uh, inhabitants. Uh, Stanley Kubrick, who of course started out as a, very, as, a, as, a, as a news photographer for Life magazine, he went there himself and started taking pictures of the these, of these surroundings with already the action of the film in his, in his mind. And all of a sudden, imagining this place 
not as a place that was actually bustling with new life and young families moving in and everybody being extremely happy that finally they, they had hot and, hot and cold running water and a toilet in their own apartment, but no, to imagine it nearly as a kind of alienating, <coughs> extremely modern, extremely dehumanized uh, uh, surrounding. Taking pictures of it as if it were on the moon, as if it were a spaceship. Having his assistants and his wife uh, posing as, as possible the droogs in, in the film later. And then, of course, this, uh, this scene is, is one of the fa most famous ones. Here you can see the droogs uh, walking through and, and also unleashing their kind of bestial rage at each other. And, of course, then what happened is that this image was forever... Uh, associated with poor Thames Mead and uh, it never really recovered from it. It was sort of infected uh, with this uh, image of uh, ultra-violence. You have to imagine this of course with synthesized uh, Beethoven music over it but I'm sure you've all seen the film. So here you, this is uh, the, the show, there you have the eye of William Blake with a clockwork around it staring straight at you once you... That's the great thing of the British Pavilion, it's the highest one. If all of Venice uh, uh, floods, <laughs> this place will, uh, will, uh, uh, will survive. These are the cows of Milton Keynes standing as the lions uh, are protecting it. Now, some of the stories in, in this show also talk about this, this, this endless uh, uh, obsession where, where, where br British architecture was endlessly obsessing over the past and endlessly obsessing over the future. Not so much over the present, uh, you, you could say. This is, for example, Inigo Jones, the, the great British classicist. He imagined, and always the past was being constantly reimagined as something that would fit uh, fit the agenda for the future of the architect involved. So the architect here was always an archaeologist and the archaeologist was always an architect. Here we have the architect Inigo Jones saying we have to build classically in England because the, one of the oldest elements of classical architecture is the Roman temple that later became Stonehenge. Inigo Jones by reconstructing Stonehenge in this way as extremely kind of uh, regular, orthogonal nearly, uh, tried to prove that it was actually not built by pagan druids, but by Roman architects. Hence, giving himself a pedigree for the future in uh, classicist architecture. But later, uh, later the architects of, the ba of Bath Crescent, did, they said, architecture in England has two reasons for existence. One is Palladio, the other is Stonehenge. These two things are the true roots of British architecture. And also these, the architects of Bath Crescent made the point, also were archaeologists who reconstructed Stonehenge a hundred years after Inigo Jones and said it was a place of pagan worship. But of course this was in the period that uh, nearly reaching the period of, of uh, William Blake, getting closer, where this idea of, of a local pagan uh, culture was being uh, uh, made acceptable and even uh, covetable. And then, more than a hundred years later, one of the worst slum areas of Manchester, called the Hume Estate, famous from uh, Friedrich Engels' book on the, the, the uh, conditions of the working class in England, was finally demolished and the workers were giving back their dignity by commissioning the largest single housing estate ever built in post-war England. And when Owen Wilson, uh, Owen Wilson and, the, uh, the, uh, um, and Lewis Womersley designed this, they said, only the best is enough for English workers. We are going to take the best from English architecture, which is the Bath Crescent, and expand it so that instead of housing 13 families, it will now house 3,000 families in the Hume Estate. And each time these references were made very consciously, very explicitly, with a great kind of propaganda-like uh, force. 
And then, of course, what happened to the Hume estate? Here you can see it just after being finished. Architecture, uh, through, due, due to an accidental mistake, whereby uh, in the construction of the of the of the, the I think it was the fences uh, on the galleries, uh, a young boy fell through, was killed, and then the families that had just been moved in demanded that they be moved out again because they said this is not a place fit for families. So all of a sudden, the, the green, the England's green hills in between the Palladio, Stonehenge, and Bath Crescent references didn't work so much for them, and they demanded to be moved back to normal houses. And so then the entire Hume estate was declared to be only fit for people without children. Hence, creating, oops, <laughs> uh, creating. Uh, one of the largest, you could say, accidental bohemias uh, that, that ever existed. Because then all the people who lived there were young people, squatters, the art scene, the music scene, etc. And the most famous band, and also the, the factory record label was based there, the first factory club, and Manchester's most, fa most famous band, uh, Joy Division, uh, actually uh, did their first concerts, this is very distracting, isn't it, to, to watch, uh, did their first concerts and also perfected their aesthetic, uh, you could say, of this extremely doomy, extremely kind of obsessively dark uh, uh, band that actually imagined themselves to, to live in uh, Warsaw, because their first name for the band was Warsaw. Joy Division is a name taken from, na from the Nazis, etc. They imagined themselves to live in a kind of, kind of post-war Europea East European uh, dystopia. That was their fantasy. And also their most famous picture, also present in the show, made by Kevin Cummins, is of the bridges that connect uh, the, the two parts of the of the estate over the over the motorway, and this is their first picture of these these depressed young men standing there with their long coats, uh, their sh very short hair, which was special in 1978, and trying to look as if they are deeply depressed poets in Saint Petersburg. The interesting thing is when we interviewed Kevin Cummins, he said. I took this picture not so much of the band, but of the space. This picture is of the space, because the space of Hume, especially on this wintry day, represents the aesthetic and the emotion of the music uh, the best, as I'm sure everybody who's heard Joy Division uh, will agree. Later on, however, uh, the Hume estate also became this wondrous uh, area just before it was demolished, uh, of nearly a kind of, you could say, a kind of William Blake, William Morris type landscape with people just living wild on these hills. Uh, th there were uh, travelers, punks, hippies, all living there together, nearly in a kind of autonomous uh, society apart from the rest. So it's, what is interesting about these things is how these myths that underpin a modernist culture like the English can sometimes, without the architect even being in charge of bringing them out or making them explicit, they nearly come out accidentally. It's like, it's like of course, you have to be kind of paranoid critical to see it, but you, you, you can see how the history, let, let, let's say it like this, the history of architecture is much more interesting for what happened accidentally than for what happened by design and sometimes also much more forceful. Now, one of the, the themes, and uh, to continue a little bit and to leave a little bit uh, England uh, behind, moving to the mainland, is a theme that we call the welfare state baroque in one of the rooms. Why did we call it this? It had to do something with, this is one of the, the, the models that we had made of the, of the Hume estate. It had something to do with the fact that English modernism at a certain point in the 60s, early 70s, reached a kind of size and a kind of formal expression and a kind of heaviness and a kind of, and a kind of you could say, nearly delusional ambition that you could say it became Baroque. 
it, 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 it reached a kind of expressionism, even just using the rhetoric of function and the materials of prefabricated concrete, and it became ripe and baroque. Another thing that we also wanted to express by mounting these models in this way, our, uh, our reference for this were the Elgin marbles in the British Museum, these kind of disembodied fragments of what once was a, a coherent piece of, of, of architecture and sculpture, and that now it is just incoherent fragments just standing there in twisted ways, thereby underlining the enormous historical distance between us and the culture that produced these fragments. And that is a, a, a point that we wanted to make here, that the welfare state Baroque, the time that the welfare state was at its height of its ambition and its confidence, is now an unreachable, unreachable in the past. It has disappeared over the horizon. All our fantasies that we might save the welfare state, or revive the welfare state, are we should get over that. That was our sort of polemical statement. But then, of course, nobody got it. Everybody said, hey, that looks like one of the spaceships in Star Wars. <laughs> so, well, anyway, you know, uh, that's probably a much better uh, interpretation, anyway. Uh, here you can see the, here you can, the first one is, this is the, the Thames Mead buildings uh, uh, in which a clockwork orange played, and here you have uh, uh, the Hume estate, and there you have Cumbernauld um, in, in Scotland. Now, uh, sorry to, for this shocking uh, image, this welfare state Baroque has, has recently again come to our attention when once we discovered or it was also brought into the news, and this is something that happens again and again and again in the past years, that this is Amedi Koulibaly, one of the, the, the other uh, attacker in the Charlie Hebdo uh, tragedy, the one who attacked uh, the Jewish uh, supermarket. And this is the place where he was from, La Grande Borne. The, the, this is not, maybe not even a welfare state baroque, it's welfare state Rococo. Uh, the uh, Emile Ayot designed uh, estate at north of Paris in Grigny. He came from there, and immediately the press was also all over it, saying that these horrible uh, 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 Parisian uh, estates uh, that produce a kind of alienation, that produce, that are completely no-go zones, according to American cable news, that, um, that, that are a kind of the source of such aggression that will one day uh, bring down uh, Western society. A few years before, and, and, and this is where Amedi Koulibaly was brought up, in this strange whimsical landscape with, with giant ceramic pears or doves sitting around it and, and young families <coughs> living in these snaking blocks. And it is such an a surreal landscape, and then imagining also the, uh, this boy uh, coming from there. Uh, something similar happened a few years before when Mohammed Mera, uh, who, uh, who attacked the synagogue in, uh, in the school in, uh, in, uh, in Toulouse in 2011, I believe, or 12, 2012, he actually grew up in another legendary, you could say baroque, a modernist estate by Candilis and Woods to lose Le Mirai. That's where he grew up. And so also here, so he grew up in this um, wonderful fantasy of, a, of how a society could be shaped uh, by, by modernist architecture informed by sociology because Candilis and Woods folded all their, these walk through flats or walk up flats around it neighborhood centers so that the mother could see her child playing in the yard of the of the of the uh, of the primary school uh, so this actually it looks ho horrific but actually it is based on a scenario for life that is completely humane and completely benign and completely uh, uh, you could say idealistic now this this kind of idea of, of that 
places that were designed using the best of human, uh, you could say, emotions, the best of human uh, wishes, the best of human ambitions, that these places could then turn into something that would produce uh, monsters that would come back and destroy us. This was already formulated by the British uh, uh, conservative, or what should I say, uh, uh, polemicist uh, uh, and, and prison psychologist, Theodore Dalrymple, who talked about the barbarians at the gates of Paris, also, also using this explosive language, of course, the barbarians at the gates, He's calling, surrounding the city of light are th threatening cities of darkness. And he's describing these cities of darkness as the French housing estates in 2002, mind you, uh, that would once come and destroy uh, uh, the city. Now, interestingly, to Dalrymple is, he talk of design and politics as politics, he, co he completely conflated his critique his architectural critique of these places as being concrete and horrible with the welfare state that produced them. He said it's the same thing. What produces the monsters is the welfare state. The idea uh, that, you can, uh, uh, that, that you can pamper and na the nanny state idea of society, everything institutionalized, everyone taken care of, everyone treated like children, that will produce children who will attack you. Well, so it is exactly the same kind of rhetoric as used by Margaret Thatcher a little bit earlier when she completely abolished British planning and social housing. So this critique, and the, this critique, for me it's a very, very ambiguous thing. At the same time you can mourn and be shocked at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the state of these places. At the same time you notice that some of the mourning and some of the being shockedness about this is part of a very, very political agenda. A political agenda that is aimed at dismantling the, the welfare state. Here you have Christopher Caldwell in the New York Times, also talking about the revolting high-rises, a nice uh, newspaper pun, and uh, also blaming, laying the blame for the riots of 2005 squarely at the feet of Le Corbusier, who died in 1963. And and this, for us, at the, the, uh, became one of the, uh, still is actually, one of the, the biggest obsessions that I have. Like, okay, wh what, is with, what is with this? This blame the art, they, they blame, look, they blame, art, so you can blame architecture for causing riots. And then all the architects say, and all the progressives say, you cannot do that, that's ridiculous because uh, it's society and it's uh, uh, racism and it's um, uh, unemployment. On the other hand, and, and anyway, how can architecture ever cause people to riot? On the other hand, this is the same architecture, of course, that was that is born from the belief that architecture can change the world, that architecture can create societies, that architecture can change people, can create can create new people. So this categorical refusal of any responsibility of architecture for the social problems that it causes, I, never, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't accept that. On the other hand, if you see that all the categorical blame that was being laid at the feet of the architects, that was part of a whole other rhetoric. That was part of a rhetoric that said, see, that's what happens if you do social housing. Then people turn into monsters who kill each other. You know, so, so both of them have a kind of nearly hysterical approach uh, to what uh, architecture uh, can and cannot do. So we started um, uh, researching these rights. This was ground zero. This was where two boys were killed in a police chase. And then the Clichy Soubois started rioting and then it spread like wildfire, but not continuously. It didn't burn up the pavilion air suburbs in between. It started to spread to the other places where there were high rise social housing suburbs around the city. And then they started, and then all looked like this. And then they started spreading all over Paris. This is, of course, a kind of a play on the situation in the map of Paris. 
Here you can see that the, the, the spreading of the foam, it's, it's like, like a castor from lymph node to lymph node. Kind of thing, and it spreads throughout the whole of France. France. So the whole France is united in, 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 in a place, place that, that the rest, rest of the French, French would rather not even know, know that they existed in the first place. place. And, and every, 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 every morning, morning, the people who live there would wake up to scenes like this. this. And when, and when it was dark, dark again, the rioting and the burning would start over again. And this went on for more than a week. And then we had to accept this idea that this somehow led to that. That the hand of the architect, that it is literally the form of the architecture, the ambition of the architecture that leads to uh, the, these burnt carcasses of cars uh, downstairs. However, studying it a little bit more deeply and really putting things into their sequence, it turned out that indeed there was a 100% correlation between the riots and the sort of architecture where it happened, that all the, all the riots happened in modernist housing estates. Yet, not all modernist housing estates produced riots. There was one thing that all the riots had in common, though, and this was the fact that they were being subjected to enormous urban renewal projects. That, that the, the municipality developers were saying, we have to demolish these flats, we have to bring in normal houses, we have to bring in normal people, etc. It turned out that one of the major uh, sources in all the interviews that were being done with the rioters one of the, and with the sociologists studying there was that one of the major causes for rage and frustration and distrust in government was the fact that they knew the people who lived there especially the boys, the young unemployed men, that they knew that they were not being wished for, that, that they knew that because their houses were being uh, de demolished, they knew that in all the rhetoric of urban renewal, it was all about the, long, the wrong combination of people is living here. And so it, it turns out that, yes, there is blame to be laid at the feet of architecture, of design, etc., but more on the level of if you present these enormous scaled uh, uh, transformation projects, because the, the ambition of demolishing all, the, all these flats in all these places at the same time from a central dictate of the French government is at least as ambitious and at least as megalomaniacal, you could say, as building them in the first place. So it's not like we as a society have learned that now we do things in a more bottom-up in a more sensitive way. No, we have not. We only convince ourselves that we have done that by making the architecture look as if it might be more sensitive to scale, but in fact the whole machinery behind it, the whole real estate and financial and policy making and decision making machinery behind it is just as megalomaniacal, just as huge as it was in building them at the first place. You could say, at least then, the architecture looked as big and as institutional as the policies behind it. And now there's a kind of confusing contrast between small-scaled architecture and massive national uh, policies that also sh scare the shit out of the people who live there and cause them maybe, or maybe, uh, contribute to their frustration that then ultimately could express itself in violence. Uh, London, uh, the, uh, 2011, the summer riots, uh, there also you could say even if these riots were immediately uh, either uh, put in the, in the corner of uh, the, um, just criminals, ignore what is happening, just lock them up for, uh, forever and throw away the key, or victims who are, re re who are revolting against uh, oppression. Uh, also here, it would be interesting to, to start to understand a little bit more of the structure of the city before the riots in 2011 happened. And what you can see in London is this kind of polarization uh, of, of, of income groups. You could say that, that all the gray, the grayish tones are disappearing out of the city, the middle classes, and just very rich and very poor people live there anymore. And of course, at the same time, 
uh, architecture uh, uh, at the same time, urban pol politics have become more or less uh, projectors standing on, uh, on building sites. And, and, you, and, and also here, also from the interviews done by The Guardian and the LSE with the rioters, one of the things was that they constantly had the feeling that their city was being demolished from underneath them, that there was no place for them. So if there was no place for them, why should they uh, behave like uh, adults uh, anyway? So uh, this is one of the f most famous architectural uh, images of destruction uh, in the, the London riots, the, 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 the Tottenham carpet store. Uh, here it is after uh, the next day. It's now destroyed. But this has become an iconic uh, image. And this, this is, of course, something that is happening uh, all over the world. Uh, the idea that, uh, that, the, that the, the way that the city is taking shape, the way that the city is being changed, is being demolished and rebuilt, is something that, is, that, that the, the people of the city have, they cannot touch it anymore, they cannot reach it anymore, they cannot control it, they, they feel victimized by it. In China, for example, uh, China is one of the countries that is most fearful, or one of the states that is most fearful of, uh, of um, social unrest, of riots, etc., and has the most of it. Uh, most of the social unrest in all the mass incidents of China, you can see they're getting more and more, the, 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 the uh, majority of them are about things like land grabs, demolitions, people being pushed out of their land, uh, etc. Uh, things like this. And one of the major tools that the, the Chinese government uses uh, to quell the social unrest is to, and this is also a, a conscious policy underwritten by the party, is to intensify the amount of uh, propaganda. One of the, one of the, the major uh, uh, instruments for uh, intensifying the propaganda to kind of quell the unrest was uh, the modernizing of the state television. And so they, 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 they modernized state CCTV, Chinese state television, and wanted it to, to, to be, become much more of a political tool. Yet at the same time, the architects who designed it, a, a, a Dutch office from my city actually called the OMA, they, uh, they actually believe, and I'm not saying this ironically, because they actually do believe this, and I think it's good that they believe that the building, through its form, through its architectural properties, specific architectural properties, can infuse transparency, because it's made of glass. Sorry, you shouldn't laugh. <laughs> You're insulting somebody's belief system. Uh, they infuse a building with glass and, and, and publicness, and thereby, yeah, as you can see here, the many publicly accessible functions of the new building progr program point towards a possible democratization of the institution. At the same time, so voila, um, at the same time, if you read in this EU uh, report about, you, 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 can, you can read that uh, the heightened indoctrination is a literal point of policy for the Chinese government. And I always find this because I know the seriousness I also think it's a fantastic building, incredibly intelligent building. I admire the seriousness and the deepness with which OMA, I mean, it's not like they just dropped an icon uh, here and there in China. The deepness with which they have invested themselves in this, in this uh, society, in this political system, and yet they... <laughs> so this idea that architecture in itself can be a force that through, due to its architectural properties can inject something in, in a political system, I'm still pondering that because I cannot believe that it's cynical or I refuse to believe that it's cynical. Ah, here you have... Uh, and, and also we need, we need, this is a Renier de Graaf, one of the principles of OMA, and he makes very clearly also that it is the reality of his office that they work for the most part in undemocratic countries. And what I admire is at least the kind of deep uh, engagement with that. But back to uh, Europe. Um, there's Gezi Park, I'm not going to say anything about that now. 
I want to go forward to something. This. Back to Europe. We talked, I said some things about the welfare state. Now, something that has been worrying uh, or, or uh, my office for a while, of worrying, I mean, that in a good way, it keeps us awake, it keeps us active, it keeps us trying to figure things out, is this thing of the, this kind of thing that we did in an emotional way in the, uh, in the, uh, in the British Pavilion, that we said, the welfare state, let's forget about it. You know, let's, I mean, especially in the English uh, context, there were so many, uh, you could say, uh, progressive uh, critics uh, who said that the welfare, we, that we have to save the welfare state, etc. We said, you know what? Forget about it. It's gone, it's gone anyway. So instead of holding on to it, flogging the dead horse, we, we might want to do something else. And it was, it was a kind of a provocation nearly to ourselves. Like, can we accept that we are living in a time after the time that we were growing up in. That there's really a paradigm shift in how we are living together and how architecture fits in society. That was the kind of, the kind of provocation with those welfare state Baroque things that was, were then misunderstood as being about Star Wars. But we, we, with our office with Crimson, we started to hypothesize further on that. And this is a kind of curve that we made, and it's about the welfare, because the images that you just did not see were of Brazil, and in Brazil you can see, and in South Korea, you can see actually that government is becoming more interventionist. Government is, is unfolding healthcare plans. Government is making planning in Brazil. It's a very fascinating progress. A process much more inclusive, much more participatory, uh, but also much more uh, public. So on the one hand, uh, you, ca you can see some countries, Brazil, South Korea, who are building up something that looks suspiciously like our welfare state, while we in the, in the European Union, we're already on the slide, UK is preceding us uh, quite some distance, the US even more, and then uh, Norway is more or less on top. We presented this uh, project, uh, this was our idea to an open call for who could do the, the, the Norway Oslo uh, architecture triennale. And we said that's what it should be about, because Norway is actually on top of the welfare state. Does the mo of course, they have endless oil money, etc. They all like each other, and they, there are not so many of them. And they, they, they have a fantastic welfare state, and it's at the top of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of its development. But of course, when we presented it to the Norwegians, they didn't like this curve at all. Because where can they go? They only can go down. And, and so it, it appeared, it, it, it turned out, and we didn't mean it like this. This was us being kind of slimy to the Norwegians, like, look how great you are. And then to them it became, uh, it turned out to be a kind of a threatening uh, uh, prospect. Uh, bec uh, because they could only slide down. And that, was, that turned out to be the, uh, an enormous taboo in uh, progressive cultural Norwegian circles uh, that we had, did not have a great deal of knowledge about beforehand, uh, that this was a no-go area. Uh, but still, the idea of, of the welfare state as something temporary, you know, as a phase that, that you go through, as, as maybe an anomaly in the history of a society, that there was this phase where we managed to kind of accumulate and aggregate all this uh, political consensus, technology, fiscal possibilities, and a kind of a cultural consensus, and, key, and do this welfare state, which, which creates a kind of, uh, you could say, frame for a society to, to develop in, um, that once you develop in it, it becomes very difficult to imagine that you might not one day have it anymore. And I think that is a kind of a very painful thing that we are going through uh, now, that we, are, that we are realizing, oh my God, it was a dream. This never really happened. I mean, it did happen, but it only lasted for 20, 30 years. And now everything is, it's gone. It's, it, we might have to start, I don't know, killing each other on the streets again. Um, so one of the studios that we are doing right now in, uh, in, in, uh, in Delft is called New Utopias on the Ruins of the Welfare State. And again, it's a kind of a provocation 
uh, to say, uh, of course, because we're not that far yet. I mean, I know that in Holland the welfare state is still actually pretty much uh, functioning, but in a kind of on a kind of imaginary level, it is seen as something that is going uh, uh, down. Uh, also, the banality of good was actually about this. The banality of good, in hindsight, was about the same phenomenon. Because when we measured our 50 test sites uh, of new towns that we that we measured, you could you could see the way that through how through from the 50s all through the the, uh, the current uh, decades, you could see how all the forces shifted from a kind of um, a, a, a kind of harmonious uh, representation of classes much to much more uh, uh, the upper and, and higher middle classes. Also, the sources of money are, are coming much more from, from private sources and private consult internationally operating private consultancies. So also here, uh, the one thing that was always used as the great tool uh, to create a kind of a model of an equilibrious uh, social democrat or welfare state society was now being taken out of its original political context and, and used to create, you could say, tax havens or uh, gated communities or uh, smart cities or uh, etc. So we were going from this, the, the, welfare, the, the dream of the welfare state, uh, uh, to places like this, where now we are living in a situation where a city, a whole city like Detroit, can actually be treated as a business, you could say the same of Greece, uh, and, 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 and seriously being confronted with the possibility, you're going bankrupt, we'll have to liquidate you. That's it. You're like a business, no bi so that we are now treating uh, cities, communities, with the same paradigms and the same categories as we are used to do a business. At the same time, you, you can see the only thing that is working in Detroit are casinos. So you, you can see this, of course, this is a caricature, caricatural uh, 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 example. Uh, you can see places like New Songdo, an entire cities being uh, informed uh, just by the, 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 the digital uh, industry, uh, the router uh, uh, in industry that, that wants to make entire cit smart cities entirely uh, uh, wired. So in the city is built for the uh, software and the hardware company to sell its, uh, its uh, stuff. So what we are, what we are, what we, what we proposed to do is to ju also to escape from these kind of caricatures that we are surrounded with, is to really measure, like, okay, where can it go? Like we have this welfare state consensus. What is coming into its place? On the one hand, you have kind of uh, projects that are an axis of corporate profit fo founded on idealism founded. On the other hand, you can have projects that seek to start over again, the autonomy project, the, the Kropotkinesks of the 21st century. On the other hand, you have, you have ideas that want to reform uh, the system, that want to work within the system. And it is interesting that you, you, we, we, we try to create a whole landscape of political and urban uh, new projects that somehow would fill in uh, this uh, graph. You could have the, the, to start very close to home, our kind of social democrat, but still uh, project developer slash uh, architect uh, alderman and vice mayor of Rotterdam, where the city itself uses iconic architecture to market itself as a city, whereas the alderman of 30 years before would never do that with a commercial program. He would always do that with a public program. You have cities, other again in the Netherlands, a brilliant project by the, uh, the, uh, the visionary uh, politician Adri Duivestein, who commissioned OMA, funnily enough, uh, to design uh, a circular town uh, for cheap uh, house or for, for uh, affordable housing uh, but that all the housing should be built and commissioned by the people themselves, thereby trying to escape from the institutionalized powers of state-funded uh, public housing. So you can see these kind of movements away from the classic welfare state. But in some countries it happens in a much less controlled, much more aggressive way. Uh, this is uh, Sheldon Adelson, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, American 
um, uh, casino king and also one of the biggest donors of the Republican Party buying up an entire piece of Madrid uh, to, uh, uh, to build a new, uh, a new uh, a city called Euro, Euro Vegas that would not pay taxes to anyone but would employ maybe Spanish people. Of course, we have, we have, uh, we have ideas where, whereby nearly, you know, like uh, the nearly the circle, like uh, I, I have the wrong image here, just that Facebook is economically just as big as Italy. Um, the, uh, there are ideas that you can just escape from the state and from all types of state institutions by combining all the, the, the possibilities of social media and digital industries and you, would, you wouldn't even need a state or a public sector or government or uh, collectives anymore. Yeah, I'm nearly done. You have, we have our own uh, ZUS, uh, people who are trying to fill in the holes left by public government uh, with, uh, uh, with, with kind of crowdfunded public architecture, as you can see here, the lift single. We I'm not going to say anything about this. Uh, we have people in Detroit who are nearly like William Morris, uh, uh, trying to, to, on the ruins of this, of this bankrupted industrialist city, uh, every, everything is so uh, cheap and so desperate that they are trying to build up a nearly a neolithic, they're doing the neolithic farming evolution uh, all over again. So, yes, I'm, I, I, that should be enough. I'm, but the last thing that I wanted to say is actually this. Let's accept that our cities are in upheaval. Let's accept that we are sometimes in crisis with our city. Will the kind of fires that inspired uh, William Blake, do they also inspire us? Uh, does the, the fire in the, in the Tottenham Towers, does that inspire also the kind of visions that might in the end create new models for society uh, as they did in the 18th century? We, we don't know. Will they inspire this or this? Or, or, or will they... Will, what we actually need, what I'm saying is, maybe we need a kind of a new metaphysics for after the welfare state. Not just, we don't just need the solutions, we don't just need the Dutch approach, you know, like finding solutions for things, but maybe we also need a kind of new level of imagination and this new kind of craziness, this new, and that is something where we could learn from the British maybe, the, the tradition of mysticism, uh, maybe long forgotten, but still somehow reachable, uh, that we could find, in, uh, for example, if you look at the, the holes that are being filled in, this, this is... This is a, a, an urban farming hipster community in uh, Detroit, but this is a, an extreme right-wing traditionalist Hungarian uh, uh, a new community called Jobbik, the Jobbik populist Hungarian party, that is, that is creating entire villages around eco eco ecological, traditional Hungarian values. Or will it lead to these kind of dreams of the caliphate that then explode in, uh, in violence? Will it lead to, to architects nearly coming together as a kind of Kropotkinist uh, community? This is the, the uh, com architects community of Meik. Uh, I don't know, but I think um, some metaphysics might be in order in the times uh, that we live in. Um, I'm going to leave you with, uh, <laughs> with uh, this. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I took so long. <laughs>